Welcome to Forum 360 on Fusion, your PBS channel and your Rubber City radio stations. I'm Stephanie York, your host today. Thank you for joining us for a global outlook with a local view. As a former Teamster and daughter of a UAW worker, Ohio State Representative Tavia Golonsky knows the importance of rewarding hard work and putting family first. As a new state representative, Golonsky is using her legal expertise and work experience to address the biggest challenges facing the state in improving the quality of life for residents in the 35th House District, which consists of portions of Akron and Barberton in Summit County. Today, Representative Golonsky will talk to us about what it's like being a new female Democrat legislator in a predominantly male Republican House of Representatives, her views on the uptick in sexual harassment allegations against politicians, the fiscal state of Ohio and how that affects local families, and Ohio's opioid problem. Today we will find out exactly how hard the job has been so far, what strides Representative Golonsky has been able to make in that Republican heavy house, and what she is going to tackle next. Welcome, State House Representative Tavia Golonsky. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very I'm so much glad for to have me. you here today. I'm delighted to be here. I would like to start off with you telling us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up as a state representative in the 35th District of Ohio. Sure. Well, the truth is, right after the election, in which I was very, very disappointed, I thought to myself first, how am I going to tell my children? How am I going to go and explain to them what happened? And then next I thought, I love my job as a magistrate. I love what I do. But God, I'm going to look for something further. I'm going to look for something that I can do on a larger level to help families. And I didn't know what that was. I had no idea where I would go from there. But I thought, I'm just going to sit quietly and listen and wait for you to let me know, God. And after 14 years at the Summit County Juvenile Court, I was ready for a change, but I just had no idea what that, was be, what that would be. And imagine the surprise when I got the call in uh, late February, early March. It's a thrill. That's amazing. Yeah. It's like the perfect job for you. It really was. <laughs> and I honestly, I never considered being in the legislature before, but as soon as I heard about the opportunity, I remembered my one tiny little regret in life is that I was never a part of the military. So mm -hmm. this kind of an honor to serve the public on this large of a level at the government, right at your state house, I just feel and I felt at the time just extremely honored. And I do take it for complete and total public service. And just knowing that, I just want to be the best that I can. That's wonderful. Can you tell us what areas your district encompasses? Sure. All of Barberton that you mentioned, and also Firestone Park where I live, and the other following parts of Akron that I'll go over. Kenmore, Ellet, Goodyear Heights, a tiny bit of Springfield, and a tiny, tiny bit of Coventry. Um, so those are my areas, and I just love everything about it. Good, hardworking <coughs> families um, who just need a hardworking representative. Wonderful. Um, what do you think are your district's most pressing issues? And are they the same issues for all of Ohio? I would have to say for my district, my district is urban. And it's, um, we have, um, I'd, I'd say about 36% in poverty. So, I mean, we have a very serious uh, issue with the working poor and people who are just barely above that, uh, that uh, area of poverty. And so, no, it's, it's not the same as all of Ohio. Um, certainly in our district too, here's another unique thing that we found out was that um, a number of people in our district are uh, f facing uh, food deserts. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really like the parts of Ohio that get the most mention, I think, which, which are the rural parts. But unfortunately, it's very similar to the remaining parts of Ohio as far as uh, serious opiate addiction problems. So we have all of those problems, but the thing that I love most about my district is that these are very hardworking, matter of fact people who are practical and they want to make improvements in their life. Um, some of them feel angry about being left behind, mm -hmm. but they're excited about um, what could be and what possibly could be. They have a lot of pride in where they live. Okay, so I want to talk about some of the issues that sure. you brought up or that's going on in Ohio. Let's mm -hmm. start with the opioid addiction problem. Yes. 
Um, uh, how prevalent is this in your district, if you know? And yes. um, what are you doing to bring this to the state's attention? Or do you think they're on top of this? Sure. Uh, as you know, uh, Montgomery County received the, the, you know, no one wants to have this distinction, but being number one, and certainly Cuyahoga County received that distinction as well. But Summit County is a, thir a close third. Mm -hmm. And certainly parts of my district. Now, recently, I think there was some attention paid to Barberton as far as being number one, as far as Barberton hi ho Hospital for a uh, percentage of people who had overdose. But I think what we need to realize about Barberton is it, it, maybe that was unfair that they got that moniker because in fact, people come from all areas and then end up at Barberton Hospital. So they could come from Green, which is not in my district. And so perhaps that is an unfair moniker. But the, the facts remain that in, in fact, large portions of my district uh, are included as far as the opiate crisis. Um, and it's really unfortunate because um, I think we're just like everyone else as far as perhaps we had kind of a pill mill sort of mm -hmm. uh, involvement. And then what that led to with people not feeling uh, strong education uh, being in their background and not having strong economic uh, possibilities as far as jobs, I think that unfortunately people have taken to opiates. The good news is that we also have a strong peer recovery center based in our area in Barberton and also in those sections of Akron that I named. Do you think the state's on top of this problem? Well, I'm just going to be honest with you, Stephanie. Uh, we're in an emergency. Mm -hmm. It is raining, and frankly, it's a storm. And so for me, that all signals that the rainy day fund is the way that we need to go. So yes, the state is aware of it, but to provide the amount of money that the state did um, is really just a drop in the bucket. It's a $1 billion problem, and we were only given millions of dollars. And I know 100, I believe it was $173 million uh, was allocated to the opiate crisis. That might sound like a lot to people, but it's a $1 billion problem. And so it's really just not enough. Okay. <clears throat> what can we as citizens do to help with this epidemic? Well, the thing to do is to open our eyes and to see what's around us. Here was a shocking fact that I found out from the Realtors Association that one of the main things to look out for is to make sure you lock up your own medication. Mm -hmm. So we, we often think of someone going and getting heroin on the street. When it, really one of the main uh, culprits is actually prescription misuse and overuse. And so if you could think about, let's do what we can in our own individual homes, which is to secret away and to take very good responsible care of our own medication. That's a first good step. Second step as far as keeping your eyes open is look around for signs in your own teens and signs in their family fam or their friend circle to see if maybe there may be concerns. Obviously the things that you hear about with drug overdose or drug use, which is a change in personality or a change in who they welcome in as their friends. And then it again, individually, we can be aware. I believe that with the crisis being what it is, we should all become trained in the use of naloxone, Narcan. Mm -hmm. uh, I became trained at the juvenile court and I recommend it, carrying naloxone with you. Maybe it's um, in the trunk of your car or maybe it's, I used to carry it in my purse. And at the state house, um, you know, I like to know who's trained and who's available because Narcan can save a life. Uh, someone's overdosing, active overdose, you can use Narcan to save them. So other than that, keeping our eyes open and being aware, locking away be responsible for medications. Well, those are really good ideas that yes. I hadn't thought about myself. So sure. I will go home and check my medicine cabinet <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit. I've heard a lot about the infant death mortality yes. rates in our area yes. in Akron. And I want to know, um, are you aware of this and is your district affected by this? Yes. Thank you for asking. This is um, a problem that unfortunately I don't believe is getting enough attention. Fortunately for all of us, we have the mayor of, of Akron who is paying attention and who understands the race component. And so what we found is that whereas, for example, we do have a high infant mortality rate ac across all demographics, but specifically black babies are three to four times more likely not to make it to their first birthday. And that is devastating. And so recently when we saw the mayor pu putting uh, infant mortality on the front burner and showcasing how important it is to make it to your first birthday, I had to look within myself and ask, what can you do within your district, which is affected by some of the main zip codes? I served years ago on the infant, uh, the Child Fatality Review Board, and that was when I first learned of the infant mortality 
concerns that actually can be boiled down to one main thing stress on the mother to be mm. and so I love what the the mayor is doing as far as wrapping arms around these young mothers these new mothers and trying to say what can we do to help you get to your 40th week uh, how, how can we make sure you get to term and then that kind of an outcome can positively impact on a baby. The, the better chance a baby has, the, the more likely the mother has gone to term, the more likely the baby has a chance in that first year. And so uh, reducing the number of premature deaths is a huge uh, feature. Well, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the statistics are, are stunning. Yes. And um, I'm glad that the mayor is focusing his attention on that. And exactly. hopefully we can start reversing that trend. Absolutely. Um, do you see, has there been some sort of trend reversal yet, or is it still too early? Well, the one thing that I did notice, and which was mentioned also at the mayor's uh, recent uh, forum, uh, trying to make sure that. Uh, babies arrive at their first year was that uh, there has been uh, a lowering, a tick, low, uh, we're going down in the number of deaths due to co-sleeping. And that's excellent news, that's great news. But still, when you're talking about premature births leading to death before the first year, unfortunately, we're st that number's still up. So it hasn't lowered our overall numbers the way we sh it should. So, but it's important to say, hey, we've made a big change in co-sleeping more people becoming aware that it's not a good idea. I was just thinking yes. that's probably due to all the information that's getting out exactly. and the better education to yes. the mothers to be about the hazards of co-sleeping and exactly. things like that. Exactly, and for fathers too mm -hmm. to understand and to be a part of that, those first uh, difficult weeks and months sure. of yes, they're crying, but it's better for them to be on their back, alone, and also a new one for me that I didn't know about, which is they should be in the same room with the parents uh, during that first that year. Yeah, uh, and that's that's great because you can really hear and listen over to it, see what that little person is doing. And plus, I think it helps a lot with bonding. So that's great. Very good. Um, let's talk a little bit about the fiscal state of Ohio and how it affects your district. Sure. The truth of the matter is, way before me. Uh, the state has been reducing the amount of local funds for years, frankly. Um, and what's the net effect of that? Well, the effect is uh, we don't have as much as we should have to do the things we want to do in our local districts, like take care of roads, um, increase fire and safety security, and to do the things that matter to the constituents. Don't we all want a safe and walkable neighborhood? The answer is yes. And I find that in Firestone Park, Ellet, Kenmore, and Goodyear Heights, uh, you can just look at the roads and see what kind of care they haven't had. So what, have the what does the mayor have to do? And similarly in Barberton, you've got to find a way to increase your own funds and increase your own um, responsibility. It's not, I mean, they're taking responsibility, but what can you do to increase your own funds? And therefore, we saw issue four on the ballot, rightfully, thanks to the taxpayers, it, pa it passed. Absolutely. And that's, that's what should happen. Those who use the Akron area should contribute to taking care of it, and that's what issue four will do. And I think that's what we've seen is that, that reduction in local funding and unfortunately Stephanie not to tell the truth about what's really going on but that money has gone to townships um, you know in the Republican held uh, House of Representatives, um, a lot of those representatives represent those townships, and they've gotten a lot of enhancers where really, really, we're just still struggling to stay above water. And that's been one of the unfortunate things as far as fiscal responsibility. On the House level, uh, I, along with Amelia Sykes, we fought to keep that, any of the small bit of local money that we could, to keep that in our districts, and we were thanked for that. Um, but really, it's been a long-term de deficit. The other feature that we've all noticed, um, I'm sure, is the reduction in public school funding. Oh, absolutely. And what does that mean? What it means is that even if our own children, my children do attend or did attend uh, Akron Public Schools, our daughter still does, but even if your own children don't attend, you'll notice in your lowering of your property values if the public schools face a hit. And none of us want that for our area. Don't we have the responsibility of caring for all children? I care about all children and the outcome. And that means high quality public school education for all. And as you know, the DeRoth decision is 20 years old and still we haven't made changes in funding. It's hard to believe. It is. That we've Sad, had, really. We've had a um, 
are, are the way the schools are funded has been declared unconstitutional yes. over 20 years ago, exactly. and, the, and it has not. Uh, the legislature has not made a change in the way it's funding. Right. Uh, it's very it, I'm sad. not sure how that that How does it happens. continue? How does exactly. it continue? It is unconstitutional, but it does and we're seeing, you know, the ramifications of that and it's very we are. sad. We are. Um, I would like to remind our viewers and those who may have joined us that we are here with state representative Tavia Galonski talking about the issues that affect our nation, the citizens of Ohio, and particularly those in Summit County. You really are in the minority when it comes to the House of Representatives, and I call it the trifecta of minorities, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's it like being an African-American, female, Democrat, legislator in a predominantly white, male, Republican House? You know, really honestly, Stephanie, even though I, re I recognize those are my truths, Really, the other facts are as follows. I've had the kind of experience, biography, and background that has prepared me uniquely for this challenge. Um, I went to a high school that was predominantly white, male, and actually Catholic. And um, But at the same time, as you know, I was a flight attendant for Delta Airlines for many years, traveling international routes where I got to meet thousands of different people and to travel to many different countries, actually. And that kind of a background uh, prepared me for uh, the experience of being a good advocate for hardworking families. And really, at its base, that's what my district is all about. Now, what do I do when I take that down to uh, the, the uh, State House? What I do is I'm delighted to work with anyone. And what I've done, which is a bit unusual and people have kind of noticed, is I actually seek out people that are different from me, from myself and from my district to find out what are they thinking, what, what would they say about these issues, but then what I do is I find commonality. Family brings a common goal to everyone. As soon as you start talking about things as far as what touches our families, I'm able to reach across the aisle to Republican men who are, you know, maybe even twice my age, but who are, you no, know, obviously they're not twice my age, but they're older than I am and they've had different experiences. But I'm able to reach across the aisle to them and say, what about your daughter? What about your grandchild? What about your wife? Aren't these some of the issues that matter to them? And the issues that I brought to the State House that I believe are important are, in fact, important also to these grandfathers, fathers, and men. Yes. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, it, is it frustrating, your job, um, being a Democrat in a, with a Republican majority? I mean, are you able to get things done the way you would like to? I have to say that, again, through no fault of my own, but maybe just sheer luck, no one at the State House wants to be associated with the strange and unusual bent, if you will, of our nation. A lot of odd things that we've never seen as lawyers, we've never seen as Democrats, we've never, Republicans haven't even seen this type of behavior on the national level. It makes everybody very interested in what's going on locally. And what that means in Ohio is, and everyone should be delighted to know, that people want to work together. They want to work together to solve problems. And so, frankly, even Republicans are reaching out to me. They're, they can they can see that I'm excited, I'm the new person, and I'm not jaded. I do want to see what we can do together. And believe it or not, that's calling for excellent work groups. I was just recently placed on um, a, a gover excuse me, a legislative uh, work group that involves school funding. So, you know, what are we going to do to change it? The room was packed. It was packed wow. full of legislators from all walks who are interested in seeing how we can make a difference. And again, what do you do? Do you bite off everything? No. You take small nibbles. You find out who you can work with. I decided I want to work specifically with the fiscal responsibility related to uh, per pupil funding. And so I'll be working there, but I'll be able to reach out to people that I haven't worked with before and who are eager, just by being in that room, who are eager to work together. And I'm thrilled about that. Wow. That's what I'm doing. You certainly aren't jaded <laughs> yet. <laughs> Let's hope you don't get there. Yeah. Um, I'd like to change the focus a little and talk about the uptick in sexual harassment allegations against politicians. Yes. What is your take on this? Well, I, I'm just like every other Ohioan is frankly shocked and appalled. But to be truthful, as a woman who's had my own personal experience and challenges along the way um, and things you couldn't laugh off, what we're finding at the State House is, is that we're, the people are being asked to 
what was your what did you know and when did you know it what's your accountability and what I've discovered is that my first question honestly as the lawyer in me was you know do we have a public do we have a, a policy against sexual harassment and what I'm doing along with Teresa Fetter uh, is we're trying to find out what policies are in place who are we accountable for the normal way of looking at things in this type of legislature is that you look to the the leader who is the speaker and then we have a leader within our own minority caucus and you do look to the leaders to find out what are they doing and and will they lead by example and fortunately for us so far we have had that we do see that um, everyone's interested in full disclosure um, there have been public records requests and also everyone's interested in finding out what what's going on and how do we safeguard Ohio's children when you send your young people to the Ohio State House uh, to work and to find out about public policy what are we doing to safeguard them and I'll have I'll just let you know that many women along with other men though also with men we have joined together to discover is there a problem that we need to fix? What can we do right now? Which is not just my own legislative aide, who's a very young, uh, new person to the state house. What can we do to safeguard their challenges? And part of that is to keep your eyes open too. Do you think sexual harassment is is new or more common now, or are women? And it's been mostly women coming yes. forward, feeling empowered to come forward now. We have to admit the truth is that women feel empowered. You know, who knows? Did it start with Anita Hill when we were in law school? Mm -hmm. Back then, we, you know, in, I believe it was 91, was when we were first watching this. Really, we have been spectators. We've been realizing maybe that did happen to me, but let's see what happens with her. And that, thank goodness we can all see that more women coming forward to say, this happened to me and it wasn't right. And frankly, what we need to do is we need to uncover some of these secretive methods of paying people off what's happened and what what will be the result I think women are empowered they've said that when they've come forward is I heard so-and-so speak and therefore I feel strongly about coming forward and that's what I want our young people to know when they come to the state house to work that you have strong representatives strong leaders whether it be women or men who want to say enough is enough and we're not gonna put up with it so as a mom, sure. I'd like to know how these conversations went over with your children yes. when discussing not only the sexual harassment allegations that are coming out yes. amongst politicians, but entertainment you know, um, yes. professionals as well, actors yes. and actresses and, and, and things like that. What kind of conversations have you had with them? Well, this is when you find out if your parenthood has really, if, you're, if you've done your job. And what I'm delighted to find out is that with our 20-year-old son, he has said to me, I can't imagine treating anyone that way because for him, I'm his most important role model along with his grandmother, uh, excuse me, is his grand, both his grandmothers, excellent role models. And then also, I hope my, myself as a woman being an excellent role model. And he says he just can't imagine uh, not protecting and safeguarding the young women in his world. Um, he says, unfortunately, he noticed a lot of strange behavior at parties in college mm. that he wanted to safeguard his friends from. Then hearing from my daughter, Gabriella, 17, but she's employed. She works at the local library as a staff member. And what she said is that even some of the subtle jokes or, or things like that, she's noticed that, you know, really isn't that the beginning? And could that be the beginning of crossing lines? And so where she hasn't had the experience herself, she's wondered if those jokes or inappropriate comments might be the beginning of, um, of what we need to curb in, in the workforce, which is everyone pe being treated the same and not to be humiliated and not to feel debased. And, and you and your, um, your mother, so yes. being strong women role models, yes. isn't it just as important to have those males that respect exactly. women in their lives? Yes. So you can point to all the males that treat women respectfully yes. and um, caring for them and, and, and just being treating them as an equal yes. and, and not as, you know, something else. <laughs> exactly. And fortunately for me, I do have a very strong role model at home. John Galanski is an excellent role model as a husband and a father. I remember hearing him say one time um, out in public speaking at a father's rights fatherhood initiative meeting, he said, I just want to be the first person. I want to make sure that I'm the first person that tells my daughter, I love you.
and never let that be some stranger who's trying to convince her of something or who's trying to, you know, steal her affection. To hear him say that and to realize how important that kind of a strong role model is to a daughter, I feel blessed. Yeah, everybody should, you know, have those in their lives. And if they don't, I hope that there are volunteers out there, you know, through the big brothers, big yes. sisters and things like that, that are stepping up to provide those role model. Exactly. Um, I do hope for that for everyone. Um, well, we are running short on time. Oh. So I would like to... Um, I'd like to close out. I have a couple more questions, but we'll have to sure. save that for another time. I'll have okay. to have you back. I'd be delighted. Thank um, you. Today we found out that it's not easy being a Democrat representative in a Republican House of Representatives, but there is hope yes. that people are reaching across the aisle. Um, our guest has made big, big strides in order to help her constituents in the 35th House District that includes portions of Akron and Barberton. I want to thank our guest, State Representative Tavia Golonsky, for joining us today to talk about what it's been like being a new Democrat legislator in a predominantly Republican House, the changing political landscape due to the increasing number of sexual harassment allegations against politicians, the fiscal state of the state, and how this affects her district and local families, and of course, Ohio's opioid problem. I'm Stephanie York, your host today. Thank you for joining us on Forum 360 for a global outlook with a local view. Thank you. Thank you. Forum 360 is brought to you with support from Electric Impulse Communications, Kim and Harvey Nelson, Rubber City Radio Group, Acronist.com, Hudson Cable, Medical Mutual of Ohio, Forum 360 supporters, and the Shaw Jewish Community Center of Akron.